بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The title of today's or tonight's lecture is Mental Illnesses and Suicide And I made a mistake by accepting such a title <laughs> And this indicates that I may have a mental illness But a mild one inshallah Because when I thought of Zakallah warm hot okay when I thought of researching this I found that I am in the middle of an ocean without any shores and this requires a lot of study and to do this I'm not qualified and psychology is not children's game it is a science and it impacts people's lives and it is a serious thing to devote your time and effort to providing you have strong foundation in Aqeedah and therefore when people come and say can we study psychology and the likes we say no unless you do your studies first in Aqeedah so that you will be founded on strong bases because usually a lot of those who go into this field lose direction and they come up with theories and ideas and they believe in such things that are against Islam so I did my research but I found that I would be speaking in a field that is not my field and this is not fair I'm not used to giving people something I'm not good at so I thought of what might help you in the sense that if you look in the Quran and the Sunnah and this is what we base our beliefs on we find that it does not mention mental illnesses as we know them today but it breaks some kinds of emotional change or imbalance into what can be classified as mental illness so what is found in Islam insanity and sanity that's it so Islam focuses on the accountability the competency of an individual if he acts in a certain fashion is he accountable or not so the prophet said in the hadith that you all know sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rufi'a al-qalam an thalath the pen of accountability has been lifted from three categories of people a child until he reaches the age of puberty an insane person until he regains his sanity and someone who's asleep until he wakes up so when we come to define what is considered to be insane majnoon in Arabic or not insane that is all of us inshallah then we have to go a little bit into details what is the impact the impact is if a person who is classified as insane does something should we hold him accountable or not so an insane person not performing wudu and praying he is not accountable to pray let alone to perform wudu an insane person who kills others who destroys property should we hold him accountable should we execute him should we do this or not 
These are all classifications and rulings that are found in Sharia. Ah. Now, let us look briefly into what falls under the category of mental illness. Those who have mental illness, please raise your hands. <laughs> MashaAllah, we have only two. Ya Latif. <laughs> Three, oh, four. Now they're, it's contagious. Allah is there. Ah, may Allah protect us. See, what is meant by mental illness? Usually, it's synonymous to us. When I say, do you have mental illness? It means, are you crazy? Are you insane? Are you lunatic? You don't have brains? This is what a mental illness usually means. But this is not scientifically correct. Scientists say it is an imbalance. It is a disturbance in either your emotions, it is in your thinking, it is in your behavior, it is in your decision making. And all of this, anything that impacts this can be considered as a mental illness, which means it can be very mild. Most of humans have it or can be very severe. It can impact your work. It can impact your family. It can impact your own life. And this all falls under mental illness. But are they all not accountable? Not at all. And this is why if you look into how scientists, psychiatrists, scientists of psychology divide this, they say that such illness is divided into two types. Neurosis and psychosis. And this is dealing with something that is widely spread among people, not necessarily dangerous, neurosis. They say it deals with depression, it deals with anxiety, it deals with stress, and it can be very mild. Everyone gets stressed. Does this mean we are mentally ill? Temporary, yes. Does it impact our decision making? No. Likewise with anxieties, likewise with uh, obsessive compulsive order. Sometimes you may get phobias. People who are having fears of places where crowds are. You would find them agitated. You would find them sweating. You would find them maybe red faces because of this phobia. Some have phobia of darkness. Some have phobia of insects, spiders and ants. Some have phobia of closed places. I think they call it claustrophobia. If you go to the elevator, they cannot go with you. They have to walk the stairs. By the way, I walk the stairs. Not because I'm uh, uh, having phobia of elevators, but it's good fitness. So all of these are considered to be mild, can be a little bit severe, can go into anxieties, etc. And then there is a psychos, the, uh, what they call the psychosis. And this is usually known as crazy. This is really severe. It can be uh, um, uh, psychiatric, people with manic disorder, people with uh, schizophrenia in severe cases. This is accompanied usually by hallucination, by delusionals, being delusional, imagining things. You can hear people saying that, I hear voices. I see things. They're obsessed with things that impact their decision making. They, it impacts the way they talk. Sometimes they're unable to speak because of this. And when they speak, they don't make any sense. They have a lot of things that impact their mood and attitude. Sometimes it's very mild. It goes and comes back. Usually it's not long term it is like fits 
It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. And sometimes it becomes dangerous where the person, the individual harms himself or he may harm others. He may burn things to the ground and enjoys burning things. He may enjoy harming people, killing people. He hears voices telling him, your son wants to kill you. You have to kill him first. And it goes on. Hallucinations. They are so worried. Whenever they see a knife, they hear voices that take the knife and kill your son. And they are terrified of this thought because they don't want it, but they feel themselves being pushed to it. They fight and fight and fight. Now these are only the tip of an iceberg. And psychiatrists, scientists have studied these and made volumes and volumes describing such people. And not all what they describe fits us, but this is found. We could have stress. We could be uh, um, having anxieties. We can have panic attacks. And this is normal. And we cannot go into lots and lots of details, but if we want to look briefly and not in depth about the mental illnesses that might have been, might have huh, been mentioned in the Quran or in the Sunnah, we find, for example, that in the Quran and the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ used to seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal from al ham wal hazan what is ham it is the worries that you fear coming in the future while al hazan it is worrying about things that took place in the past so ham deals with stress and anxiety of something coming and happening in the future while hazan deals with depression when you feel that something in the past is haunting you and this is one of the means of treating it how seek refuge in allah and we will get a little bit more in depth about getting closer to allah now if you go to psychiatrists or people that deal with psychology and the likes, they will usually give you medication, they will give you treatment, they will give you counseling, but all depends on worldly matters. While Islam directs you to what? To spiritual matters. Because Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Ra'd, Al-Ladheena Amanu وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ What a beautiful ayah. Those who believe and find their heart's tranquility in remembering Allah. By Allah, the hearts are finding its tranquility in the dhikr of Allah. So the best medication for mental illness is dhikrullah azza wa jal if you go and read in the quran you will find that also among the illnesses found in the quran is despair known as al yas yas or despair is a murder weapon you want to kill someone quickly make him despair Go to cancer patients. Go to chronic illnesses patients. Just make them despair and they'll die in a couple of weeks. But if you give them hope, if you attach their hearts to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala would help him, will help them and save them. Allah says in the Quran, and Allah will save those who feared him by their attainment no evil will touch them nor will they grieve so no evil in the future no grief 
for the things that happened in the past. Providing what? Providing that they fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And the despair is mentioned in many places in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, and when we bestow favor upon the disbeliever, he turns away and distances himself. And when evil touches him, he is ever despairing. Why did he despair? Because evil touched him. So this is one of the reasons why people get despaired. Is when evil touched them. And also when Allah takes away from you a favor or a blessing, you will also be despaired as Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَئِنْ أَذَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنَّا رَحْمَةً ثُمَّ نَزَعْنَاهَا مِنْهُ إِنَّهُ لَيَأُوسٌ كَفُورٌ Whenever we give man a taste of our blessing and our mercy, then we take it away from him, he is in despair and in disbelief or in gratitude. So this is mentioned in the Quran. Many places in the Quran there are other and other illnesses that take place. Among the well-known illnesses, mental illnesses for us that we agree and approve of, yet the Western doctors may not agree, is the whispering of shaitan. Now, if you go to any psychiatrist and say, uh, I have whispers of the shaitan, he will say, you're hallucinating and you're psychosis and you ha have to take you and put you in a mental hospital because you might kill yourself because of the sounds you hear in your head. And I say, no, I know that this is shaitan telling me to steal money or not to pray. I know I can hear his voice. He said, no, 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 this is hallucination. Allah says in the Quran, indeed, those who fear Allah, when an impulse touches them from Satan, they remember him and at once they have insight. Even those who fear Allah, this is a very high level. But Allah proved to us in this ayah that they may be touched by an impulse of shaitan. This happens. So even if you are a righteous person, shaitan can give wiswas to you. But the difference between us and them is that the moment we remember what happens, shaitan goes away. So this is why remembering Allah, we always say that this is the best remedy. If you have any mental illness, always and continuously remember Allah. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Allah Azza wa Jal also says in the Quran, and say, my Lord, I seek refuge in you from the incitements of the devils. And I seek refuge in you, my Lord, lest they be present with me. Then the devils are always with you. And the Prophet said, والسلام, that they run in our bodies like the blood. So we cannot escape them. Then how to reduce their impact? By remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. There are also different types of mental illnesses with different names. So your anxiety, your paranoia, your phobia, your stress, all of this can be found in different types of shapes and shades. So we have, for example, the fear of Allah. This is not an illness, though Psychiatrists may consider it as an illness. They say that this cripples you. This prevents you from advancing. Does it? Yes, it does. It prevents you from advancing into haram. So for them, you can be a famous singer or a dancer or an artist or a sculptor. But you fear Allah Azza wa Jal, it hinders you. Everyone says, you're an artist, go ahead and do it. And you say, no, 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 my fear of Allah hinders me. They say you have to go and see a shrink. You have to see a psychiatrist because he will help you. There is the fear of death. Is this negative or positive? 
Positive. Positive. Those who say negative, raise your hands. It can be both. It depends on the end results. Someone whose fear of death is crippling. He's in despair. Go work. No, I'm afraid I might die. If I take the lift, it will fall. If I drive, I might have an accident. If I cross the road, a plane may, might fall on me. I just want to sit here in the corner and pray. And this is what? This is crippling death. And this is why a lot of the people despair of Allah's mercy. Go and pray. No use. Allah Azza wa is putting me in hell. Might as well. Let me drink some wine. If I'm going to hell. Enjoy it. No, this is crippling and the negative fear. The positive fear is the one that drives you to Allah. So I'm afraid of my sins. What to do? I'm going to Umrah. I will fly, I will drive, I will go to Mecca, I will make Umrah, I will make Dua. But still I'm afraid of my sins. I will work hard in my job, nine to five, do overtime, collect more money, give in charity sponsor an orphan print a book because this fear is what positive this is what our scholars used to say in the past they used to say maybe one bad deed will admit the person to paradise and maybe one good deed will admit you to hell how is this possible they said a person who committed one single sin and he is remorseful, he is afraid, he is sad. His positive fear tells him you have to pray night prayer to expiate. You have to fast voluntary, you have to give charity, you have to do good deeds. So he's trying his level best to erase that sin which will inevitably and eventually lead him to Jannah. On the opposite, I go and make Umrah. A good deed? A very good deed. On my way back, I listen to music. Why? Because I have credit. I have credit. I topped my account. Now I, I have credit. So I can withdraw a little bit from it. And this sin, this good deed, will encourage me to do a lot of sins and a lot of sins and a lot of sins until I enter Jahannam. May Allah protect us all. So, this fear can be positive and it can be negative. There is the fear of being exposed. And this is why people conceal their sins. Two people conceal their sins. Someone who's afraid of Allah and someone who does not fear Allah. The one who does not fear Allah and he's a hypocrite, he's a munafiq, he does everything haram in secrecy. Not because he doesn't fear Allah, uh, not because he fears Allah, because he fears the people. The second person who is shy, remorseful, does the sin in hiding, he fears Allah Azza wa Jal. And he hopes and prays, Ya Allah, do not expose me. So such a fear to the psychiatrist might be a mental illness. And this is why they come to you and say, go do what you want you want this you love this do it in the open challenge people they go to the sisters why wear hijab why cover your whole body if allah did not want you to have this beauty he wouldn't have given it to you so zakat of wealth is giving it to the poor and zakat of your beauty is unveiling it and making people enjoy it this is what they come to you and say this is how shaitan works there is a great amount of fear in all of us from risk we all fear are we going to get the salary at the end of the month are we going to get a profit will we be able either these are working now because i have fear of heat but fine huh? it's raining so I was just happy to. Hey, next time maybe you need a fan for the Sheikh. We have a lot of fans, alhamdulillah, but we need a specific one. 
So the fear of risk is in everybody's heart, except in true servants of Allah, such as the birds, the animals, the fish. They have no problem of fear of risk because they go in the morning, they know that Allah will feed them. We, on the contrary, have provision for two, three years, but we're still doubtful. I wish I had of five years just to be safe rather than sorry. And there is always the anxiety and the fear of the future. What will happen in the future? And this comes to all of us. Will I be able to get my daughters married before I die? Will I build a house for them? Will I maintain this or that? Can I be doing this or that? I fear. Will I maintain my health? Will I get a heart attack? Will I do this? Will I? It's the fear that's occupying your mind. From whom? From a shaytan. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا ذَٰلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Verily that this is shaytan intimidating you with his own soldiers. So don't fear them, but fear me. And Allah Azza wa Jal also mentioned in Surah Al-Mujadala, إِنَّمَا النَّجْوَى مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ لِيَحْزُنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَيْسَ بِضَارِّهِمْ شَيْئًا إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ What is Najwa? Anyone? Najwa is private talking or discussion in isolation of someone else. So if we are three in a room, me and my friend, we're talking secretly while the third person does not know what we're talking about. This is called Najwa. And it is prohibited in Islam. MashaAllah. Saved by the bell. Alhamdulillah. We have a fan. One of my fans is coming. Jazakumullahu khayran. Why do sheikhs always have privileges? <laughs> this is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Yeah, and this is, uh, but let's hope it works first. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Inshallah it works. So, shaitan's job is to intimidate you. Huh? The shaitan's job is to scare you, is to depress you. It is prohibited in Islam to do what? To do najwa. Again, what is najwa? It is two speaking in the isolation of a third. Now, you have to listen to the... I think this will affect your uh, mic. <laughs> this is a shield. <laughs> so... <laughs> put it this way, put it. Put it, put it to the wall. Indirectly, so... That, yeah. I get breeze and you don't get any distortion. Good. <laughs> what is Najwa? When two speak in the isolation of what? A third. What will happen in the heart of the third? When I speak to my friend and laugh, he thinks that, oh, they're plotting against me. They're making jokes at me. They don't like how I look. This is why Allah says that Najwa is from shaitan. Why? To depress the believer. And this is why it is prohibited. And this happens when I go with the brothers driving me to an event, two of the brothers are Malay, speaking in Malay, and I'm at the back. And I don't know what they're saying. Shaitan comes to me. Shall I strangle them? <laughs> Shall I go to the driver and hit him so that he makes an accident and we all die? They're talking about me. <laughs> Shaitan works, huh? They're talking against me. And they're not. And so many times I travel with an Arab friend and the driver is not an Arab and he speaks to me in Arabic and I said wait and I tell the driver excuse me sir we would like to speak in Arabic would you allow us and the driver says of course yes no problem why are you asking I said because my religion it is haram and this is one of the ways of da'wah so this kind of fear comes from shaitan the fear of death 
the fear of the future, the fear of your risk, the fear on your children. How can we cure such fear? How? Tawakkul to depend on Allah Azza wa Jal. When you fear death, ask yourself, is it a possibility that I will never die? Maybe. Is it possible? Kullu nafsin maut. Each soul will taste death. So this is not possible. So how can we fix such mental illnesses? With all its wide spectrum, with all its wide range, without going into details. Because sometimes details would divert you from the solution. Number one, the best form of treatment of mental illnesses is the religious treatment. And this, by the way, has been proven by Western psychiatrists, non-Muslims, disbelievers. They say that there is nothing like religious treatment because it gives you hope. It gives you something to hold on to. Non-religious would come and say, mm, it's difficult. The best cure is suicide. And we will come to this type of cure, inshallah, soon. Not that we will do it. I mean, the ruling of it. Also, when you come and look at what Islam provides, Islam provides you with remembering Allah. It provides you with a lot of dhikr. And when you make dhikr, this saves you from a lot of mental illnesses. On top of the list is prayer. And this is a prophetic remedy. Mother Aisha says, and other companions, whenever the Prophet ﷺ had worries, what would he do? He used to pray. Whenever he had something occupying his mind, he would pray. Because the moment you say Allahu Akbar, you leave this world and you depend entirely on Allah the Almighty. Now, in the West, the rate of suicide is extremely high. And if we look at suicide, logically speaking, not religiously, Logically speaking, it is the best form of escape. Because it's game over. Khalas. End of game. But Ali ibn Abi Talib said beautiful verses in shi'r, in poetry. He says in, in Arabic, وَلَوْ أَنَّا إِذَا مِتْنَا تُرِكْنَا لَكَانَ الْمَوْتُ رَاحَةَ كُلِّ حَيٍ وَلَكِنَّا إِن مِتْنَا بُعِثْنَا what does this mean? He says, if we were to die and be left alone, death would have been the comfort for every living creature. Unfortunately, when we die, we're resurrected and then we're held accountable for every single thing. And this is true. So suicide is to kill yourself, to end your life to harm your body which leads to dying whether through different means consuming a poison throwing yourself from a high building hanging yourself stabbing yourself drowning yourself there are so many many ways of killing yourself the problem is that those who kill th themselves think that their problems and trouble would be over and they will never be over. This is the beginning of their misery, not the cure and the end of it. What are the symptoms that usually people may go to suicide if they have it? Number one is depression. And depression are degrees. Almost Every Muslim has a moment of his life that he's depressed. But 
not necessarily mentally ill, a depression that may impact how you live, how you act, how you behave. If you remember, Mother Aisha radiallahu anha said to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, was it the most severe incident in your da'wah, in your life, the battle of Uhud? He said, no. The most severe incident in my life was when I went to Taif and they rejected me and I came down. I was not aware of my surroundings until I woke up in Qarnu Tha'alib. That was hours later. He was so depressed, he could not see, he could not think. And he woke up and his depression was not because he lost money or he lost a loved one. His depression because they rejected his da'wah and did not believe in him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there are types, different types of depression. When it reaches a certain stage, a person may kill himself because of this depression. Especially when he thinks that this would change his reality and save him from what he's going through, which is not true. People can also refer to suicide whenever there is a sudden change in their lives a sudden change in their behavior. So sometimes people refer, unfortunately, to suicide when they fall into insomnia. They can't sleep. So two days, five days, seven days, it is horrible. And this is one of the ways they torture people in Guantanamo. Elsewhere, not only in Guantanamo, all the places where they have torture. They deprive you from your sleep. Once you're deprived from your sleep, you begin, you begin to develop mental illness. And your decision making is not accurate. You lose focus. You do things, say things that you're not held accountable for because of this. Maybe this sudden impact, uh, change can be at work, can be at school, can be at your social relationships if you are in a home and your spouse or your son who is always taking care of himself and how he looks all of a sudden start to smell doesn't wear uh, uh, beautiful or clean clothes this change sudden change means that there's something dangerous you have to pay attention if someone all of a sudden does not eat or overeats in a sick way and we go to the doctors and they say physically he's all right then this means that there is some sort of change happening this is not good you have to get psychiatric evaluation for that individual when someone talks all the time about suicide about dying i feel like i'm going to die i feel i want to end this why how, how is it how much painful is it if i throw myself from the window if i cut my arteries will it how long will it take until i die someone speaks to you and you say oh i don't know let me google it <laughs> what are you doing so he's asked me a question i'm just giving him the research results no there's something wrong you are having an indication that this person might be suicidal when someone starts to talk about losing hope being depressed always criticizing himself i'll never make it i'll never be a good man i'll never succeed in what i do when he all of a sudden turns inside himself so he wants to be alone he doesn't want to socialize he complains of a lot of headache he complains of a lot of uh, uh, um, unable to concentrate or focus he gets rid of all of his important and valuable things so his valuable watches his wealth his uh, things that he bought with a lot of money he gets rid of them this is a very negative sign you have to be careful those who consume 
intoxicants and drugs usually they become suicidal it's a matter of time they do it now for the fun of it once they get addicted to it once they feel the withdrawal effects on them once they cannot afford it they will commit suicide when a person is searching for the rush he wants to feel the impact of danger so he does dangerous things he dares his friends this is a highway who is man enough to cross the highway on foot they're doing 140 kilometers per hour i might die uh, this is why you have to prove that you're a man if he dares you to jump from the twin towers with a parachute it's crazy if some people may also consider bungee is it bungee yeah. bungee jumping to be suicidal yani i know duat dais who i argued with so many times and they say no no bungee jumping is good said, what good is it yani show me something beneficial so do it's fun you get the rush and you get you know the adrenaline in your body i said yes but if you jump and then it snaps and you fall you get a big pizza <laughs> on the ground he said no 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 this is safe this is uh, so such things may indicate that that individual is a daredevil he's trying to yeah, he challenge death what is he doing yes if you tell me that he is training for jihad for uh, empowering himself yes and this is why when people ask what's the ruling on jumping with parachutes said yeah if you are a soldier good this is encouraged do as many jumps as you want but if you are a civilian what would you benefit from jumping with a parachute it's not opening he says no no we have a reserve one it's not opening too now this happens once in a million who oh. <laughs> maybe it, you are you are the one in a million don't be a statistic do what is safe do what is beneficial for you in this life and the hereafter also it can be part of or an indication of suicide if a person all of a sudden stops taking his medication so a, a, a medication for chronic illnesses a person who's diabetic and he doesn't take insulin though the doctor say you must take insulin on time otherwise you may suffer from a stroke from uh, eyes uh, uh, blindness from death and he says no i will not take it this is an indication of being suicidal nowadays we have something that is very popular and famous known as hunger strike what is hunger strike not eating why the missus food is not good this is not hunger strike this is our life no hunger strike is when you go on strike and decide not to eat so that you would voice your opinion object on something or influence a political decision a person who does this is suicidal he's interested in dying and this is pretty dangerous any such indication that might be found in our loved ones require a lot of attention especially from the parents we need to listen to our loved ones not ridicule them not make fun of them care for them show them compassion show them that they are important in our lives so that we may can, may, may save someone now statistics say that 35 percent of um, uh, suicides are referred to mental illnesses 35 yet 65 percent are referred to other things so why would people commit suicide what are the reasons one lack of religious commitment if you don't believe in Jannah and you don't believe in Nar, what's the point? The least problem you get in your life, ending your life is 
a good way to escape. But a Muslim, he would never think of suicide because he knows it is hellfire. And we will come to mention the punishment of that. The second reason for committing suicide is ignorance, intolerance, the lack of patience, surrendering to falling into despair and giving up hope. This is what a lot of the people commit suicide for. Thirdly, many people commit suicide for economic problems. So they have debts, they cannot pay. The bank will take their property because they can't afford the mortgage. They, they, they will claim back the car. The boss releases them and they don't have job for a year, for two, for five years. And he has a wife, he has children. Everybody's wanting their money. He borrowed so much. What to do? Debt is a burden that a man carries on his shoulders. If you don't have religious commitment, you would definitely think of suicide. If I'm unable to get a job, I'll think of suicide. Fourthly, the amount of information we're getting from the wrong resources, such as social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, uh, TV channels, where we always see that people of intellect, high level of people, prestigious people committing suicide. The latest, they said that Michael Jackson died of suicide. Marilyn Monroe died of suicide. Prince died of suicide. Actors, directors, what's his name? This, uh, uh, so many, I, I, I don't recall the names. But if you write on Go in Google, list of those celebrities who committed suicide, you will find the richest, the most beautiful, the most famous. If these guys commit suicide, what am I doing? Bring me my gun. <laughs> I want to become famous. One of my friends tried to commit suicide. This is a joke. No, sure, this is a joke. Huh? One of my, he wanted to commit suicide. He brought a gun and he put it in the soup. So it would have double impact. There's them thinking, what gun in a soup? Gun, you shoot yourself. Poison, you put in the soup. He put a gun in the soup. I apologize. Moving on. <laughs> With the heat and, yeah, and suicide. So, also among the reasons for suicide, family problems. When a child is always abused by his father, you don't understand, you are illiterate, you're no use. Why do I have you? Look at your comparison. Look at your brother, look at your sister, look at your brother-in-law. They are doing well, they're successful. This type of mental abuse and torture reads, uh, 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 leads a lot of the people to uh, a suicide. And among the main reasons for suicide is failure. When you fail, 60% of the suicide cases were attributed to failure. Failure in paying your debts. Failure in coping with the losses in a business. Failure in your love affair. You've lost uh, Romeo, huh? you know Romeo and Juliet? What happened? Failure. They committed suicide. And when she killed herself, the man's poison did not work and he found himself alive. He got married again, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and, and when, <laughs> failure in love affair, failure in school, especially when you have abusive parents. They want you to be a medical doctor and you can't. You're good in business. You're good in management. You're good in working, but not in school. So they keep on the pressure on him until he cracks and breaks down and commits suicide. May Allah protect us all. Social failure. You're unable to reach 
the status of those around you. Zakallah. Also, there is occupational failure. Everybody's getting a raise and promoted and you've been in the same job for 20 years. No raise, no increment, nothing. And this causes you to think, am I worth it or not? Among the things that lead people to suicide is loneliness and feeling of the guilt they have. When you feel lonely and you have no one to care for you, you would probably end your life and just get it over with. Nobody cares about me. Nobody wants anything of me. If I come to work or I don't, if I show my face to the people for uh, uh, every day or I leave for a whole week, nobody's going to ring me. So what am I? Nothing. To end this, he kills himself. And this usually is apparent with youngsters and teenage. Teenagers have a very big problem that you parents must pay attention to. And it's called peer pressure. When their friends at school try to influence them and they find resistance, they would abuse. They would say bad things. And if the child is a loner and he sits in his room he doesn't have a mother to speak to when he goes to his, his father to complain the father tells him that take this amount of money and leave go go and, and buy some candy go watch a movie so he has no outlet where he can express himself and talk to someone and this is extremely important you need to devote quality time to everyone you know, to your daughters, to your sons, to your spouses, to your parents. Your parent is in their mid 80s or mid 70s and you don't see them. And when you see them, what do you do? You give them money, you give them candy, you give them food, you sit for two, three minutes, uh, how are things? Okay, I have to give, uh, leave. You need to give them time because your parents are under the eighth category of reasons of suicide and that is medical and health issues so many people when when they fall under illness physical illness they can't cope there are people who used to be excellent sportsmen they suffer an injury that takes them from the spotlight a couple of years and they commit suicide they were famous basketballers or footballers or whatever you get people and i read this couple of days ago uh, an egyptian singer this singer has a problem with his uh, uh, pigmentation so the skin is becoming white huh and the guy says, I will quit singing and I don't want to come out. Why? There's no Iman. This pigmentation is from whom? So why are you shy of? He said, no, no, I don't want people to see me. I don't want to, people to feel disgusted. Ah, you feel disgusted or not? Be proud of yourself. Be grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal and do not stop the khair because of a silly thing like this. Yes, you make dua, may Allah Azza wa cure me. If there's a cure, I'll look for it. But this does not cause you to concave on yourself and later on commit suicide. This means that you care about what the people say. Who cares? Therefore, Islam pays great attention to fighting suicide. What's the ruling on suicide in Islam? It's a major sin mentioned in Quran. Allah says, and do not kill yourselves or one another. Indeed, Allah is to you ever merciful. And whoever does that in aggression and injustice, then we will drive him into fire. So whoever kills himself will go to fire. For any reason, Yes, for any reason, and I will mention one or two afterwards. 
The Prophet said alayhi salatu in the hadith is in Sahih Imam Muslim. Whoever kills himself with a piece of iron, yani a knife or a sword or whatever, his piece of iron is in his hand, poking and stabbing himself in hellfire for eternity. Khalidan, mukhalladan, fiha abada. And whoever drinks poison, then he will drink this poison in hellfire. Khalidan, mukhalladan, fiha abadan, for eternity. And whoever throws himself from a mountain, from a high place, he will be throwing himself in hellfire. Khalidan, mukhalladan, fiha abadan. So, any type of suicide or selective types? Any type. So, if someone, for example, for the purpose of jihad, puts bombs around his waist and blows himself in the enemy. Is this suicide? This is suicide. Okay, he killed 20 disbelievers, 20 kafir. Who killed him? <coughs> Tell me. It's him. So he's the one who pushed the button? This is suicide. This is different to someone with a gun and he goes, shoots people, they shoot him, he dies. This is suicide? No, this is halal fighting in jihad under the flagship of a Muslim ruler. But killing yourself, this is called suicide and regardless of the intention. Hunger strikes, this is suicide. A woman is about to be raped by the disbelievers. Can she save her honor and kill herself? No, because killing herself is a major sin and being raped is not her own doing. And it's a smaller sin than killing. So she tries to fight her way out, tries to fight. If they kill her, alhamdulillah, good for you. That's good, but you don't kill yourself. And this is a calamity from Allah Azza wa Jal. So these things we have to be very careful when understanding that killing yourself is totally prohibited in Islam. What are the solutions for... How many hours have we been talking? <laughs> how many minutes? One hour? Ya uh, Latif. Do we have questions? Allahu Akbar. Taib, how to treat someone who's suicidal how to prevent him from committing suicide first of all you have to increase the religious dosage the more you insert in people the love of allah the fear of jahannam the uh, desire in paradise they will not think of committing suicide the more people trust allah because what is causing you to commit suicide is your lack of trust, your lack of Iman. But if you trust Allah, okay, Sheikh, I have so many debts. Trust Allah. I have so many problems in my social life with my kids, with my children, with my uh, offspring. Ah, it's the same thing. Kids, children, offspring, it's the same thing. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm stressed. <laughs> Don't talk to me like this, Sheikh. I'm going to kill myself. So, okay. So I have so many problems with the wife, I have problems with my parents, with my relatives, with my work. Trust Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah provides for 1.7 billion humans on earth, true or not true. Allah provides for trillions of birds and gives food to hundreds of trillions of fish and provides for all the animals you can think of. Do you think that Allah cannot provide for you? Trust Allah. Oh, Shaykh, you convinced me. I'm not going to kill myself. Thirdly, believe in predestiny. And this is the formula for the happiest man on earth. If you believe in predestiny, I love my beautiful Bentley. I bought it for a million ringgit. It's a beautiful car, expensive car. While I was driving, someone in a motorcycle that is 50 ringgit worth crashed into the front of it and it damaged the 
uh, a hood did damage the lights. It, uh, what would I do? Anyone who doesn't have belief in Allah and the destiny of Allah would come shout and maybe kill that person. He's not dead yet. He will kill him for what he had done. Any Muslim of you, when you have an accident, what happens? You all know. You come and say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, nobody was hurt. The car, it's iron. Why are you laughing? You know? <laughs> this is what I would do. Seriously. When I have an accident, Wallahi, I feel so cool. Of course I'm insured, but this is not the reason. <laughs> this is a joke. No, seriously, when I have an accident, I feel Alhamdulillah, it could have been worse. It's body versus body. It could have been body versus a human being. And even if I hit a man and broke his leg, he could have died. And I was probably the one who could have broken my spine or, or, or blinded my eyes or did this or that, that. Alhamdulillah, whatever Allah decrees, this is khair for me. So if you believe in Allah's predestiny, you are the happiest man no matter what happens to you. Because you have Iman. Also, among the things that would definitely take away the wish for suicide is hope. When you hope, when you have hope, when you're optimistic, this is a glass or a cup of water. Describe it. Pessimistic would say it's half empty. Optimistic would say it's half full. But it is the same glass. So you look at things in an optimistic way. Always praise Allah. Look at the positive side. Women come and complain to me. My husband is this and this and this and this and this. And I said, okay. Does he have any good things about him? She said, yes, of course. Okay, mention them to me. And she makes five times a bigger list. He's this, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's rich, he loves my parents, he honors my brother, he does it. I said, subhanallah, these good things could not cover up for the bad things? She said, wallahi, you're right, Sheikh. May Allah forgive me, end of call. When you look at the positives, you will look at life differently. Imagine the Prophet you remember this incident of coming down, huh? Jibreel comes down and says, this is the angel of the mountains. Allah had sent him so that you can order him. Now what had happened? First, the people of Mecca accused him of lying, of being a sorcerer, of being a poet, of being a fortune teller, of dividing between the man and his wife, a man and his son. So he goes to Mecca, to, to Taif, and offers the people to support him so that Allah would grant them victory. What do they say? They say the same allegations, but they order their children and slaves to throw him with pebbles until his heels started to bleed, alayhi salatu Now, if someone does this to you, and then the angels of the, the angel of the mountains comes to you and says, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Allah ordered me to obey you. If you wish, I will collapse the Akhshabain. These are the two mountains surrounding Mecca, so that I will annihilate them. What would you say? <laughs> and please take also the northern area and some of the eastern area, because all of them deserve to die. Look at the Prophet ﷺ with his feet bleeding, with being falsified, going down, depressed. But look at the optimism. He said, nay, by Allah, I'm hopeful that Allah will get from their offspring. These are kafir, but from their offspring, their children, people who would say, la ilaha illallah. What kind of optimism and hope he had, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is how you treat people with depression. You go and visit someone in the hospital, bedridden, and you say, Subhanallah, how long have you been here? He says, a month and a half. 
Yo, Subhanallah, you didn't die yet? <laughs> what are you waiting for? <laughs> Akhi, you're, you're costing your family a lot of money. Ya, Rati, pull the plug, do something. A'udhu Billah. The person goes to visit the sick to do what? Uplift their morals. And tell them, Masha Allah. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, visited Umar when he was what? Stabbed by Abu Lu'lu al Majusi with a poisonous knife that had edges. The doctor came, gave Umar milk. He drank the milk, it went from all over the wounds. He said, <laughs> it's hopeless. He's dead. He, it's a matter of time. What does Ibn Abbas come and say? Abbas, Ibn Abbas comes and says, Masha Allah, Masha Allah, Ya Umar. I always remember the Prophet saying, I went with Abu Bakr and Umar, and I came with Abu Bakr and Umar, and Abu Bakr and Umar are with me in Jannah. Giving him what? Giving him hope. This is what you should do with someone who is ill. Also among the things that may cure or help people who are suicidal, that we spread the knowledge. This is not something that we should keep hidden. We should make campaigns at schools, at universities, at work, at the people we speak with about the dangers of suicide, especially with those who have less Iman. And we've said that before, that we should listen. Give a helping ear to people to speak to you and talk to you about their problems and try to uplift their morals and if any one of us knows of someone who is depressed or has anxiety or panic attacks or hallucination or delusional or any mental illness give them a helping hand in taking them to a muslim psychiatrist who can give them assistance hada wallahu a'lam ونسبة العلم إليه أسلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد الله أكبر إلى جزاك الله خير شين فور الطاق so we are going to Q&A session there's a few questions I've received from the participants so the first question شين those who have committed suicide, are they going to hell forever? So, the question is, those who had already committed suicide, are they in hell forever or not? It's an issue of dispute among scholars because the hadith you've heard in Sahih al-Imam Muslim, Khalidan fi nari jahannama fiha abadan, that he will be in hellfire, now this is enough. But when he said, Abadan, meaning forever. So scholars differed. Some said they are in hell forever. The hadith is crystal clear. Others said, but this hadith is countered by the ayah, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. الله does not ever forgive someone who associates others with him. But he may forgive whatever is under shirk if he wishes. And suicide is committed, considered under shirk. So this is under the divine will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Some scholars said. It is best not to discuss this. The Prophet told us something, keep it as it is. But the most authentic opinion to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that a person who committed suicide is considered to be a Muslim and hence one day he will come out of hell and be admitted to Jannah, which means that he's under the divine will. Allah may forgive him from the beginning. And Allah may put him in hell for a specific period of time, but inevitably and eventually he will come out of hell. How do you say this, Shaykh? Because the Prophet 
was presented by a man who had killed himself, committed suicide. And he said, you pray upon your friend. And he did not pray himself. Scholars say he did not pray himself because he was the Imam, the, the leader of the Muslims. And he indicate, is indicated to the masses that what this man did was a major sin. I'm not going to pray for him. But you as Muslims, you have to pray on your brother because he's a Muslim. And this is the most authentic opinion, inshallah. Next question, how do you recover a person's faith of those who lost faith due to mental illness? If a person is mentally ill to the extent that he's not accountable, because we have someone who's accountable, we have someone who loses his sanity and regains it. It's, it's like fits. And we have someone that is 24-7 insane. If someone has lost his faith due to temporary insanity, once he regains, once he regains his, insa his sanity, we have to start with him from scratch because he still has something in his heart relating him to the Quran, to the Sunnah, to Allah Azza wa Jal. But if someone is totally insane, this is not accountable and it is, would be illogical to go to someone who is totally lost it and is unable to make any decision, doesn't know day from night, cannot think properly and you tell him, fear Allah or let's talk about Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al uluhiyya <laughs> This guy doesn't even know how to think. So I hope this answers the question. Next question. Um, I know that self-harm is wrong. But when I am in one of my episodes, I can't help but to harm myself. And I will feel so bad to Allah because I did that. I will always try to find ways to not hurt myself and try to make myself feel better the right way. But sometimes I still feel into harming myself. It's a vicious cycle and I'm really tired of it. I'm just trying to be a better servant and better functioning human. How should I deal with this? This is a clear symptoms of mental illness. Self-harming. Now some of us may have self-harming because they've seen the manga and the Japanese uh, stuff and the emos and they think that, oh, okay, it's fine. Or they see the TBS uh, and they want, they love the Koreans and they want to do like the teenagers do. So they inflict, inflict some harm to themselves because everybody's doing it. Some are seriously in trouble. They are unable to stop themselves and they regret like the person who's in, in the question, which is a very positive sign. To acknowledge that you have a mental illness is half of the cure. You have to walk and see a Muslim psychiatrist and tell him everything so that you can finish the journey itself. And you have to make a lot, and I mean a lot of dua. Your tawakkul on Allah Azza wa Jal. When you make sujood, when you make qiyam al-layl, when you select the times of Ishtijaba between Adhan and Iqama at the last third of the night. Here, mashallah, you have a lot of uh, uh, Ishtijaba timings when it's raining. You have 24 hours, you just make dua and mashallah, you're there. Ask Allah for assistance and help, and you will get it, inshallah. But you need to see a psychiatrist, a Muslim psychiatrist who would help you. Now, if you do ruqya on yourself and you make dua and you find out that you're not harming yourself, good. You don't need to go for counseling. But if not, better safe than sorry, do it tonight if possible, then tomorrow if not, but do not postpone or delay this at all. Next question. Any du'as uh, from the Salaf or tips on dealing with excessive sadness? The kind of sadness that drains you where you don't even have, to en have an energy to do anything? Depends if it's a mental or physical. 
If it's physical, you do proper ruqya. The best ruqya on earth is al-Fatiha. It heals you from venom of scorpions, of, of, of uh, snakes, if you believe. Like in this hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him, Sahih al-Bukhari. So you're reciting the Fatiha, repeating and blowing, this is the best ruqya on earth, nothing is equivalent to it. Do the last mu'awwidat. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Qul a'udhu al-falaq wa darab al-nas. Ayat al-kursi. Do this. But if it is something that is requiring attention of a doctor, a medical doctor. So I have an illness that requires medication and I know that it requires medication and I refuse to take it. And I just say I will depend on ruqya. No, this is not right. Allah created the illness and also created the medicine for it. Take the medicine, but there is no problem at all. Rather, it is highly recommended that you do the ruqya as well as doing uh, or taking the medication. People say that those who suffer mental illness is because they are not being a good Muslim. Is that true? I have been trying every day to improve myself as a Muslim, so it's really sad when people say that. No, no, this is part of their ignorance. As I stated before, mental illness is a very wide spectrum. Some can be related to lack of remembering Allah, lack of trust in Allah, lack in a belief in uh, uh, predestiny. But some is something that is beyond your control. Something you cannot control. You cannot come to a pe person and say, Akhi, don't be sad. What do you mean? My son just died. So it's okay, it's okay. Let's go and play badminton. <laughs> You're a believer. Have strong iman. Yaqub, who is a prophet, the son of a prophet, Ishaq, the son of a prophet, Ibrahim, when he lost his second son, he was so depressed, what happened? He got blind. Do you tell me that he is lacking iman? Or there's something in his iman? Then you're sick. He's a prophet, the son of a prophet, the grandson of a prophet, and the father of a prophet, Yusuf. But this is human nature. The Prophet himself والسلام, reacted when his son Ibrahim died. Al-Qalbu Yahzan, the heart is saddened. Wal-Ainu Tadma' and the eye weeps. Wala naqulu illa ma Rabb. And we do not say anything except that pleases Allah. And we by departing you, Ibrahim, are saddened. So the Prophet ﷺ cried so that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and another narration, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, may Allah be pleased with them both, said, and you cry, O Prophet of Allah? He said, yes, this is Allah's mercy. So you have to be proactive with what's happening to you. But it's totally wrong to attribute such reactions to lack of Iman. This is only human nature. Now, Islam limits this kind of reaction so it does not exceed anger is a human nature when it exceeds it limits it's become haram and transgression and when you don't have anger you lose jealousy you lose interest of protecting your wealth and health and your religion so you have to have this balance and allah knows best next question I often pray and read the Quran, but why does my heart feel so empty and uneasy? I often go to the gym and work out for an hour, but I don't see my muscles growing. <laughs> why don't I see them growing? Because it requires consistency, continuation, devotion. If you go to the gym for a year, you will be noticing the difference in your body if you recite the quran and allah Azza wa Jal has the highest example of course but it's an issue of belief and conviction the arabs at the early times they were real arabs they understood the language the prophet reads one ayah 
the guy is 180 degrees transformed. Now you read the whole Quran to us. Interesting. It doesn't click because we need to practice. We need to worship Allah. We need to have devotion of your heart and then you will find the impact that is positive on your heart. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot force it to drink. You can read the Quran every day, but if you yourself don't want guidance, if you don't ask Allah Azza wa for guidance, if you don't thrive, strive for such guidance, then you will not be able to enjoy it. And Allah knows best. I feel broken, I feel alone, I feel empty inside. I am in pain and now at the same time. Perhaps my pain is so much now that I can no longer distinguish it. It is a physical pain like a weight of my, on my chest. I pray five times a day, I make dua, I make stifar, but it's hard. I have no motivation to keep it going. I don't know what I'm moving towards. My goal and hopes have all slowly faded away. I am thankful for the blessings Allah has given me. I do not complain to others, I try to complain only to Allah. At times I feel so bad for feeling this, so what can I do? You should feel bad for feeling this. This is not normal at all. So yes, you may find like mentioned in, in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ They are touched by a glimpse of Satan. Immediately they remember Allah and they are able to see. So this comes and goes. But to be able to write and describe and clearly state that you don't like people and people don't like you, like to be alone and you're having problems though you pray, this is not normal. Now you again coming back to the same first question. Work hard on yourself. Make dua, be optimistic, have hope in Allah, have tawakkul, dependence, reliance, and trust in Allah, believe in Allah's predestiny, and open your chest to feel optimistic. No matter what happens, always look at the good side of anything that happens, and make ruqya, and make dua. If you see improvement, alhamdulillah, keep up the good work. Do not stay alone. One of the main reasons for being depressed is being alone. But, but by the way, many celebrities, many famous people who crack jokes and who rap, they are depressed. And they run from their depression by trying to be social and everybody's happy. And, uh, Robin Williams his name. One of the world known comics. Very strange person very extremely intelligent person committed suicide a couple of years ago three years ago why he was famous he was rich he was funny everybody loved him because he was depressed so you have to look if my reaction is getting worse seek psychiatric evaluation and it's not an illness don't be shy oh no 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 i don't want people to He's not a, uh, a VD doctor, venereal diseases. Huh? He's, he's a psychiatrist. He's, he, he helps you in trying to come out of your shell. You try to associate yourself with practicing Muslim brothers. Because shaitan attacks a loner. The Prophet said, والسلام, that the wolf only attacks a stray sheep. So if you are with the brothers, or, or if you're a sister, and you are with the, a circle of good practicing sisters, hanging out together, going to lectures together, checking on, on one another, you will always fight, find comfort. And you won't feel alone. But when you're alone, this is when shaitan focuses on you. Sometimes when someone is very sick in hospital, the doctor offers the family the option of switching off life support machine or giving instruction not to resusc resuscitate. resuscitate. Families may then take the patient home to allow them to die at home. Is it allowed? Can we make that decision to end someone else's life? These questions require a panel of scholars 
and uh, assisted by professors in medical sciences so that they can give an assessment. It's not for one uh, uh, person to come and just uh, uh, play, pull the plug, pull the plug. How <laughs> is that? Yeah, it's okay. Inshallah, Allah will bring you someone. Else. What do you mean? It's my father. <laughs> you, someone will pull your plug one day. The scholars say if three doctors confirmed that a patient is a, a, a brain dead, he's in a vegetation state, three doctors, Muslim doctors, and they say that all of his body organs are dependent on the machines, but he's brain dead, meaning even there's no miracle in him waking up. He's not in a coma after 10 years. He may, no, no, he is totally gone. They say, in this case, yes, you pull the plug. Now, uh, 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 not to resuscitate, what do they call it? Are the un NRD, not something like that. I don't, I don't know. They have three letters uh, not to resuscitate. Do not to resuscitate. D -T -D -N -R, it's called. This is dependent. If a person is chronically ill and the machines would only increase in his pain and suffering, where Without them, he would not live. Maybe, but you have to go to scholars and ask them. Maybe you can request something like that. But if your father or your loved one needs dialysis, and you say, no, no, this is too expensive. Do not give him dialysis. And he dies because of that? No, this is not permissible. We're talking about cases of chronic illnesses that are not recoverable, and a person would not live without these machines not allowing these machines to be plugged in so that he himself would not increase in suffering not that he would kill himself rather he would not increase in suffering some scholars say that this is permissible but again for such cases you have to go to the scholars and ask them about the verdict and allah knows best last two questions if someone's mother has schizophrenia Schizophrenia. Yeah, I always find problems in uh, reading it. Schizophrenia. Huh? And she makes sometimes uh, unreasonable demands on her son. Does the son have to obey his mother since what she asked if it's not against Islam? Reasonable or unreasonable? Unreasonable. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, disobedience to parents is a major sin. But what is the ruling? when the parent may have uh, this such of mental illness? No, you have to do whatever is best. All our decisions in life are weighed, pros and cons. So if the pros outweigh, do it. If the cons outweigh, refrain. Schizophrenia, some people think that this is split personality. So now I am practicing after half an hour I will be at the nightclub dancing this is no this is split personality is not schizophrenia is when you get hallucinations when you get voices when you get people talking to you and telling you do this no why don't you do that you find it difficult to make a decision you find it you find yourself hesitant to decide yes or no you want to stay alone, you're unable to socialize with people. It has many shades and levels for it. At the end of the day, if your mom has this case, she's making unreasonable uh, uh, decisions or requests, whether she's sick or not, don't obey her. What do you mean? Even if she's normal and she makes unreasonable requests, Give an example. Divorce your wife. Sheikh, this is reasonable. No, no, it's not reasonable. <laughs> ah, you don't you like your wife, this is up to you. No, I'm saying that sometimes the mother insists on this. Don't let your wife go to her father's house. Why? I don't want her to go. It's none of your business, with all due respect. So be diplomatic, be dutiful, be kind, but do not obey her.
in anything that is unreasonable. If she wants something that is good for her or reasonable for her, yes, you have to obey her. Whether she's schizophrenic she's or not. If she tells you, I'd like to eat chicken. I, I wish I can eat chicken. And chicken is available and it's a reasonable thing. I'll do it for her. But if she tells you that, uh, bring me cigarettes. Or I'd like to do something haram. Obeying her is haram. Because we have pros and cons. So not every time your father or mother orders you to do something that you're obliged to obey. It depends whether it is halal. It depends whether there is good for them or not. It depends whether it has no harm on you, on you or not. I hope this answers the question. Last question. How do we have a non-Muslim, how do we have a non-practicing Muslim who's dealing with mental illness? It's like having a non-practicing uh, non Muslim? Yes. He's the, not practicing. Not you have to make him practicing. <laughs> a non-practicing Muslim who has a mental illness, part of the curing process is to bring him closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And you do this not by, Akhi, in order for you to get your depression out, you have to grow your beard. The first is to go to priorities. Teach him who Allah is. Teach him the names and beautiful uh, uh, attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Tell him about how Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala created us to worship him and how Allah provided us with every good thing that we see in our lives. Tell him to appreciate Allah Azza wa Jal, read portions of the Quran, read dhikr, and inevitably he will become bit by bit practicing. But if he's not practicing and you want to get him closer to Allah, this is not logical. You have to give him da'wah, you have to try to prioritize and see what is best to call him back to Islam. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. <laughs>